truth or dare? Trouble Films is back with a whole new take on this slumber party staple. And let me tell you, Truth or Dare was my favorite slumber party game when I was growing up. Truth or Dare explores desire during a pandemic in a way that seems natural, lighthearted, lusty, and healing. The virtual orgy took place in late May 2020 while performers were sheltered in place in their homes around the world. Truth or Dare is on sale at troublefilms.com shop along with other works made by queer porn stars. This is a collective release meaning that it's co-owned by the performers and you can also get it by reaching out to any of the stars of the film Sin Sage, Estelle Bathory, Drake Manowar, Miss Mary Jane, Lita Lecherous, and Chelsea Poe. Welcome to the Peep Show Podcast. News and stories from the sex industry. With Jesse and PJ Sage. Welcome back to another episode of the Peep Show podcast. It's Labor Day, and we are focusing on the emotional labor of sex work. I'll be talking to Reese Piper about an article she recently wrote for Peep Show Media on the toll emotional labor takes on sex workers' personal lives and relationships. I'm Adrian, one of the hosts of After Adult Podcast. My porn name should be Mozart Fremont, but you probably know me better by my actual porn name, Siri. I'm Rachel, but my porn name would be Woody 16th Avenue. (laughs) After Adult is a podcast about life and porn. I don't actually watch porn. (laughs) I don't really watch that much porn either. I probably watch more than you, but I mean, most of the time it kind of would feel like going to work on my day off. You 100% watch more than me because I don't watch porn. (laughs) Find us wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for After Adult. Or visit afteradult.com and follow us on Instagram at afteradult. Welcome. I am here on my own again today. So a couple of episodes ago when I was with Lasha Lane, I was on my own and I told you guys then that over the fall, I'm going to be doing about half of the episodes on my own. And that's because PJ is finishing his dissertation. And that is it turns out fairly time consuming. So today I'm on my own as well, but I'm not really on my own because my friend, my writer sex worker friend, um, Reese Piper is coming on and I'm really excited to talk to her. It's Labor Day and we are going to focus on the labor of sex work. So she wrote a really amazing article for our website that is also coming out today on emotional labor and in particular on about her experience as a stripper for five years. And Today on the podcast, we're going to be talking about that article and also talking about um, the basically the work of sex work and in particular the toll that uh, the emotional labor takes on sex workers' lives. Let's see, before I get to talking to Reese, uh, there's a couple of other things I want to talk about. I have an exciting announcement, and that's that my Peep Show column is now in syndication, which is just really wild. I didn't really anticipate that happening. But as most of you know, I think, I was writing a weekly sex column for the Pittsburgh City paper that was furloughed in April, so at the start of you know, at the beginning of COVID. And that hasn't been able to come back there yet. But in the meantime, I decided that I would rather syndicate it through Peep Show. And I have three papers that picked it up so far. So I moved in Pittsburgh, uh, local papers, I moved over to the Pittsburgh Current. And that started last week. I also have been syndicating it through The Coalition, which is a radio network up in Rhode Island. And I, in January, am going to pick up a paper in Iowa. So the Peep Show column is spreading, and I'm really excited about that. If any publisher is listening and likes my column, uh, hit me up because I'd like to make it go even further. Um, so that's the, you know, a bit of personal news. And let's see. Anything else? You know, I think basically we've just been busy trying to syndicate my column, PJ trying to write his dissertation. We went traipsing around in the woods this week and took a bunch of sexy pictures. That was a fun little diversion. 
And other than that, I don't have anything interesting to report. So I think I am going to just move right along to Reese. Oh, one thing that I forgot to say is that we are we had to reschedule our Peep Show Live, and that event is going to be this Wednesday, September 9th at 9.30 p.m. So if you have time on Wednesday night, we would love you to watch our live event. It's going to be on sex work and disability. So that's all for this week, and I am excited to talk to Reese. So we're going to move right on to that. Thanks for joining us today. Jesse and I are dedicated to platforming sex worker voices and covering important political issues for those in the sex trades. But we can't do it without your help. If you believe in our mission, find us at patreon.com slash peepshowpodcast and show us some love. We're also seeking advertisers to help us grow. Thanks for helping us make Peep Show happen. I'm here today with Reese Piper, who is a writer living in Brooklyn. Before the pandemic, she was a stripper for a little under five years. Now she's working on a book about autism and sex work. So welcome, Reese. Hi, how are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How have you been doing, you know, with the pandemic? Uh, I've been, it's been up and down. Like, yeah. I think August was really hard. I think all of the sort of pandemic caught up with me like having to quarantine Mm. and then all the protesting in new york yeah um wait so i think june and july i felt pretty good and then come august was hard yeah do you think it was just it just became more emotionally difficult yeah and i think i like really buckled down and started working more on my book i was trying to get done like a thousand words a day and wow that's a clip yeah that was that was really ambitious of me (laughs) Are you still writing that much a day? Uh, not since I've been working on the piece for Peep Show, but... Yeah, that we're going to talk about today. That is my... No, so I'm going to take a week off after this comes out, and then I'll go back to that. Yeah, okay, so let's... Um. I want to hear about that. So you are writing a book, and we want to talk about your book, but you also just brought up the fact that you have a piece coming out for Peep Show. So let's talk about that first. Yeah, great. So you wrote a piece on emotional labor in sex work. So first tell me, like, what made you interested in writing that particular piece? Well, I think like when the pandemic first hit, you know, I was surprised by how much like I was suddenly feeling like I wanted to be in a relationship. And of course, like I first Mm -hmm. thought like, you know, it's normal when there's chaos in the world to like crave security. But not only that, like I was craving like, desire for like, to have more sex than I've had in a really long time and like more mm-hmm. intimacy and then it's like it's continued so even after like the pandemic sort of settled and we kind of got used to the idea that we're living in a pandemic this still, right like I'm still having all these feelings about wanting to be in a relationship and I'm having like you know desire been on the apps a lot more um okay and yeah I mean before I wasn't dating at all like while I was a stripper like I dated here and there but nothing really Mm -hmm. I just didn't have the desire was not there or the energy and I guess I was I really wanted to like look into like what was going on while I was dancing that I didn't really want to connect with people. So you very much like attribute this uh, lack of desire to the work that you were doing in the club huh? Yeah no definitely um I think that not only is the club extremely like exhausting, like it's a really long day, but you have to, Mm -hmm. you know, you have to be a hundred percent at all times. How long is a normal shift? I mean, I'm, I've never worked as a stripper. I've never worked in a strip club. So like, how long do you stay there when you go there? So you get there around like eight and then you're there till like three or four. And then. Oh, that is a long time. It's a very long shift. But even then, like, I still wasn't really working that much. Like, I was only working, like, you know, three, at the most, three days a week. Um, But sometimes as little as, like, one day a week. The job is you're fiending intimacy and you're building, like, these relationships with people in the moment. And you have to, like, not only that, like, you have to feel desire for them and feel excited about them and really sort of fake emotions that have to become real in order to, like, make 
you know, this kind of money in the club so that you don't have to work that much. You know, there's a difference between pretending to feel something for someone and then actually like pushing yourself to feel that. And you kind of draw on the work of Arlie Hothschild, who wrote a book 20 years ago or something about the um, difference between like surface acting and deep acting. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, what that is and how that relates to what you've been thinking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I like didn't really know these words too until I started like researching the article. So it was really like pretty fascinating to learn Mm -hmm. the difference and to learn like what I had been doing to see myself in this different light. Um, So I guess surface acting is like bluffing. It's like putting on a poker face and it's through like Mm -hmm. careful like presentation of your like facial expressions, your body language. So you're actively trying to like fake it, fake it till you make it, I suppose. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're, if you're, you need to feel sad and you're not sad, you're trying to put like a sad face on and you need to feel happy. Um, If you need to like express a certain emotion that you're then like hiding your own emotions. So there is like a sense Mm -hmm. that what you're feeling and what you're showing are separate. And that would be like surface acting. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. but deep acting and how it's described is kind of like you then try to change how you're feeling to so that what you're expressing and what you're feeling inside are the same. So, yeah, like what I did when I first started dancing, I was really into like body language and like making sure like my facial expressions matched like mm-hmm. sort of like excitement and desire. But, you know, I soon kind of learned that like it wasn't enough to like get people to get customers to spend money and to get them to spend not just like to do like a $20 lap dance. Cause the goal in the club is to get them to do like hour long champagne rooms. Cause that's how you make like big money. And if you make big money in the mm-hmm. club, you can then take like a week off. And that was kind of always what I was interested in so that I could like focus on my writing was trying to like make more money. So I didn't have to come in every day. Right. Right. And It wasn't, I soon kind of like at some point realized that like I had to then put myself into a really good mood to work. So like if I was in a really good mood then clients would want to be around me. And so it wasn't just like suppressing my own emotions. It was like actually pushed, putting myself into that state of mind where then clients would then be in the state of mind. How do you think clients can tell the difference? It's interesting. It's like, I think strippers are like some of the most like spiritual people, but like, there's always like talk of like, (laughs) I know it's always Mm -hmm. like talk of like, you need to, they know when you're a negative and you need to put yourself like, you need to be in a positive state of mind and quote unquote positive. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I always thought like, and even in my journals, like from going back to that time, like some of the earliest recollections I had were like, clients prey on negativity. Like if I'm negative, if I've had a fight, then they know they don't want to be around me. And so Mm -hmm. I guess people can feel energy. And especially when it comes Mm -hmm. down to like spending time with someone and spending money on that person, like, I guess it's important that that person be in like a positive, happy state. Is that pretty, um, I don't want to use the word universal because like nothing is universal, but is that the case for the vast majority of clients or do you have people that come in that want to you know that are looking for something else that aren't just looking for some sort of like happiness dispenser to you know live in fantasy land with for a little bit yeah I mean in my experience this was like what I you know experienced and I couldn't like I knew that if I went into work in a bad state of mind I would never make any money and if I did, it was yeah. often with mm-hmm. like really, uh, like I don't want to say abusive, but clients that were not good people. So yeah, mm-hmm. I think perhaps that there is like clients that are look, still looking for more of like a deep and meaningful, and you don't need to like have this sort of fantasy. Mm-hmm. But I still think that there is a sense that like in the strip club, you very much want to be like fun, flirty, feminine, because that is like right. you're there to party, you're there in that kind of atmosphere. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe daytime because, you know, the risk of, you know, you're in having a lap dance and you still sometimes there's no cameras in the room. And so like the risk of assault is there, Um, you know, and I don't like quite mean like what people think of assault, like penetrative assault, but like when customers like trying to like finger you against like your will, like these things, like 
mm-hmm. happen. And so I soon learned that like, if I was in a really good state of mind, then customers just, they didn't push for anything more. They just were happy with the lap dance. But if I wasn't, if I was in a bad mood, it suddenly became like, what are you going to do for me? What's what more like wanting to touch me more? And so that's just so interesting. The idea of like putting on a happiness shield as harm reduction is is really interesting to me. Do you find that with your work? You know, it's funny that you asked that because I was the reason that I asked if, you know, that is kind of how strip club customers you know, what they're looking for is because I, I don't know that I find that I don't think it's necessarily like applicable to all forms of sex work. So, you know, the, the sort of work that I do that has the most intimate, like interactions is phone sex, because that's like, I mean, I I also do porn and do clips, but that's much more performative. Um, The kind of deep connections that I usually have with customers are, in phone sex. And I don't, and I don't know if this is just a personality thing. Like it's possible that it's just that I draw a certain type of person, but I don't necessarily think that, but I'm also not super cheery. Like that's not really my personality. So I don't know that that is the sort of customer I get. I think that what, I think it's probably pretty complicated. I'm kind of thinking through this as we're talking, but I'm thinking that I tend to get people who are longtime married, you know, in their 40s or 50s or sometimes even 60s who are interested in me because they know I'm married and have a family and have kids and they think that that's like relatable. And a lot of people want to talk really specifically about their relationship things that are bothering them in their relationship or the things that they miss from their youth or um, they want me to pretend to be their spouses and like play out what they wish they could do with their Mm -hmm. wives, you know? And so that sort of character is really different. Like nobody expects me to be a party girl. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think that it can get like really, really dark and go places that I'm not, comfortable with and that happens like relatively often but but I think that from me at least and they're looking to have these sorts of like conversations that often are around regret and disappointment and things that they're working through that they wish that they had and so it's hard to say because I think that there's a way in which they lean on me as a therapist in that regard. But then, so I don't have to be all happy. What I can say is that the role that I think a lot of them want me to play has become pretty obvious to me. And it's that they often want me to be um, like a mom and a wife, but one that's slightly edgier or slightly more open or more sex positive so that they could play out like what they wish it was like. And in that regard, I think that I have to pretend to like things that I don't necessarily like because what they're looking for is like the most open, carefree version of their wife that they can get. So it's different. It's not like a happiness thing, but it's more like a I have to pretend to want every desire, even if they're things that I wouldn't actually want to do if I was really their real wife. Mm. So you're like straddling you're yourself, but you're like a heightened version of your desires. You're heightening your desires. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I know that like the few times I did phone sex that I felt like it was really in depth, like versus like in strip clubs, I felt like our conversations are quite surface level. If Uh And that like, it was much more about just like the experience of being with someone. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. In the strip club, you felt like it was an experience of just, like, close proximity. And just, like, hanging out with someone and just having, like, a good night. Because it's it's still a club and it's a party. Like, I think that's why they're, you know, a lot of people go to them because, A, I mean, either they're with a party or they're alone and they want a nice night out and they don't have anyone to hang out with. So, yeah, Mm -hmm. I don't really have in-depth conversations about people's fantasies, like, Right. But never. Even if people ask me, it's just not really a conversation. It's much more like just the experience of being together is yeah. more mm-hmm. important than like getting in depth into the head. And I suppose that's maybe that's just the difference between like a strip club client or right. phone client or perhaps it's just the different spaces. 
Right. I think that different spaces have also like allow for different sorts of experiences. So while you can just sit there and be with someone or have fun with somebody, you know, if they're not in the same room with you, you kind of have to get into somebody's head in order to create the sort of intimacy or closeness that they want because you can't do it physically. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. And so that can get pretty like intense, but in different ways. And that's kind of in different ways than what you're talking about. And that's often why I like to talk to people who do different sort sorts of like sex work, because I think that it's really all the same job and it's really all a customer service job, but the experiences that we have are really quite different. Yeah, I agree. And I think sometimes it gets that gets swallowed like by the term like sex work, which is a wonderful yeah. term because we can collectivize like collectively like organized, but right. it is very different. And like a stripper's experience is going to be very different than a cam girl's experience and an escort. Um, right. Just the sheer where you're working and like, are you working in a club? Or are you working in a massage parlor? They're very different. Yeah. Different sorts of experiences and different like atmospheres. So, you know, I, I don't know if I could work in a club. And part of the reason is because I am not, good at party environments, <laughs> you know, and I don't really like loud spaces. And so I think that those sorts of uh, just changes in environment, like change what sort of dynamics you can have. Yeah, no, definitely. And what you're capable of doing. And I think there's probably is a personality, like what type yeah. of sex work you go into, like your personality. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's interesting now, like all, if a lot of strippers are now doing online work and I wonder um, how they are finding it. Like it wasn't for me, it just mm-hmm. was too much like in the head. And it was such a different skill set that I didn't feel like I had the energy to like learn a new skill set. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A lot of people are switching to online work now, of course. So what about, what about online? Did you not like? Well, there's just certain like executive, like I'm because of my autism, I don't have the greatest organizational skills. Mm-hmm. And so like, Part of what makes stripping so accessible is that you just you go to work and you make money and you come home. Like, yeah. And while it's like a really exhausting job, um, at least you don't have to like manage all this marketing, which I find online work to be quite like, daunting. <laughs> kind of the worst part. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I um. Yeah. I let's. I want to ask you a little bit about that because earlier you were saying that when you when you first started stripping that you were like copying a lot of the um you were you were watching and trying to figure out like how you should interact with customers and what kind of facial expressions you should have and how you should act do you feel like that's connected to your autism or um what was that experience like for you at the beginning I mean, yeah, definitely. Like, I mean, I didn't know I was autistic at the time, um, but I knew that I struggled socially. And so Mm -hmm. that I think there was some sort of like hope in my head when I first started dancing that like this could potentially help me like socialize better with Mm -hmm. people. I remember getting really excited in the beginning about like how this was going to help like my social skills. Um, And while I might not have those, like I didn't exactly have those thoughts like concrete. Yeah. Because, of course, like, I didn't know, since I didn't know I was autistic, I couldn't really fully admit to myself that, like, I had social issues because that would require some kind of knowledge. But I knew that, like, you know, I, I struggled to interact with people on, like, and so, yeah, like, a large part of beginning was when I first started was, like, me asking a lot of the girls questions. They probably thought it was really annoying. Were people pretty open to answering your questions? Yeah, surprisingly. Um, and everyone, um, I mean, I worked at a really friendly club. This was in Australia, and I think it was just a bit more friendly there in general. Like, everyone used to go out after work. I mean, because the clubs are open all weekend there, so we would go out at, like, 5 in the morning, and we'd stay out to, like, the midday. This is, like, oh years ago. Now I'm, <laughs> I could never have energy to do that right now, the thought of that. But, that sounds so terrible to me. <laughs> I'm like I, I would have been like I've been I've seen you for the last eight hours I'm checking out now <laughs> I remember the first time this girl asked me to do that and I was like what do you mean 
Like, <laughs> aren't you going to be tired? <laughs> like, how do you do that? But so, yeah, they were all very, very pot, like very sort of open to giving me lots of pointers. Cause I guess it's like, maybe it's nice to be like, ask these things. Cause then it's like, you have a little pride in your work. Yeah. But, mm-hmm. Um, It was very much like one girl really sort of helped me and she's going to play like a little, I've written about her a lot, but um, you know, she was very much like, you need to like grab them and look them in the eye. You need to like constantly like be like presenting yourself as really flirty and you need to be in a good mood. Like Mm -hmm. you cannot come to work if you are in a bad mood and you need to present yourself. Like it's your job to put them into a space that will get yeah. them money and to suspend reality because that's what strip clubs are like casinos, you know, yeah. like, mm-hmm. the point is to like, that you lose sight of reality so that you feel comfortable spending these large amounts of money very quickly. Right. Um, right. So, I've heard yeah. cam girls say that too. And I think that's really interesting. Um, and maybe why I wasn't like the best cam girl. Um, <laughs> they, they would, t- I've heard cam girls talk about the fact that, you know, they had to go, on cam because it's also more of a party environment because they're talking to, you know, a huge group of people, lots of people in a room. They're trying to create like camaraderie among the guys who are watching so that they're tipping or competing with each other for bigger tips or things like that. And I've heard them say that, you know, if they are in a bad mood or if they're getting tired, they just log off because it's not worth being on there if they're not, if they can't be totally on. Yeah, I mean, because the performance takes a lot of energy. And yeah. like, I mean, what is a good mood? A good mood means that you have energy to present yourself happily, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, when you're in a bad mood, you're what? You're tired. Like, what does that mean to be in like, you know, a bad mood? You don't, you're just exhausted. And so like this right. sort of performance of like positivity itself is just, it's energy. Because it's not, yeah. might not necessarily, because it's not real like positivity isn't real it's you know you have there's all different kinds of emotions but positivity is like assuming this sort of like happiness state of mind that it's Mm -hmm. perpetual that like it's constant and that's not real right right that was one of the really interesting things about your essay to me is um talk about the fact that the capitalistic system that we work in requires a constant state of positivity um and that that positivity is kind of the face of capitalism and like propels it forward because this is how this is how people have become accustomed to spending money or how we like coerce them out of money or like um and that you know I actually before reading your essay hadn't thought about it in that explicit of a way but I think that's a really interesting critique of of capitalism and also just of our culture and i think this is also particularly pointed in america like um Mm -hmm. in an american culture but um this sort of like refusal to allow for any range of emotion besides positivity from people who are performing services for us Mm -hmm. i think who is it it's barbara what's her name um i can never say right something like that she yeah. has a really beautiful um, book, Bright Sided, that I read that kind of helped me really understand, like, the function of this and, like, especially in American society. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I mean, we really, as a, like, as a country, really focused on customer service and the experience of being, like, and the experience of just not, like, actually buying something, but, like, who is behind, who's selling it to you. And that person right. put you in a really great, like, mood so that you spend and well yeah we have the mantra like the customer is always right it's like built into the whole service industry Hmm. I have I was in a, worked in a call center before I became a stripper and then I also worked like as a shop girl which I talk about in the article but you know even there like it was required of me to, you know I had to be I had to put myself like in this really positive state of mind so that the customer itself felt comfortable and it's, it's coercive because then mm-hmm. they feel comfortable spending and it's right. a way to like, it's a way to present capitalism or the way that we function like as a society, like in a positive way, you know, mm-hmm. Cause if we actually saw workers for how miserable they actually were, <laughs> it would look, we would think twice. 
So we were saying earlier that, you know, different forms of sex work or that all sex work is, you know, a service job, but different forms of sex work, you know, are different environments and have different kinds of expectations. But um, how do you think or in what ways do you think that sex work is different than like other forms of service jobs, like different than being a waitress or working at a call center or being a shot girl? Yeah, I think at least in my experience, I think it's just more intimate. Like mm-hmm. you're a not only like physically touching, um, right? You know, you're for most dancers and and all most yeah. of the dancers' jobs I had were touching, but you're like, yeah, you know, giving a lap dance, your body to body, but right? That you're then building like a relationship with them in that moment, too, yeah. Versus like as a flight attendant or a call center or so, or, or like even a shock girl. So you're like building like a quick little fleeting relationships. Like how is your day going? Like you're showing that you care about them so that they spend money and they feel more comfortable spending money. Um, mm-hmm. But stripping, I mean, at least for me, like, I had to build relationships with them and that lasted like hours and days right. and months, sometimes years. So it becomes yeah. this sort of like the line between work and life like real life is really quite blurred I find in stripping and so no I was gonna say I find that in my work too I recently had somebody tell me that I'm the longest relationship he's ever had and I've had several like long-term clients say things like that to me where we become like their long-term relationships yeah and do you have many regulars I guess you do yeah Mm -hmm. I've only had a few like Right, because my first couple of years dancing, I was just more into like building these like emotional connections that lasted like a night, like one night. Yeah. But mm-hmm. um, I this last year, uh, perhaps because I just got a little more tired, I really wanted to do, like I built sort of I had a regular that lasted like eight months. But mm-hmm. I mean, even then, the whole goal, like in the industry, is to get like someone to spend hours with you, and so like you have to go into this like really heightened space where you're forming this like relationship for three or four hours. And to me, that was more intense than when I was a call center or shop girl. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that you talked about in the article is the fact that you felt like it was much easier in a call center or as a shot girl to do the sort of surface acting that we were talking about, but that like sex work requires, um, more more deep acting yeah um at least it felt like for me I mean those jobs were also like I was a shock girl for two summers and then Mm -hmm. I was a call center for six months so perhaps if I had done it longer but yeah that's a good point still don't think that it required me I never really thought about like I need to put myself in a good mood to go to work versus like stripping I very much had like all of my diaries are like, you need to put yourself, you need to get enough rest. You need to only listen to like, you know, you have to control what you listen to. You can't like, you can't watch anything too sad or you can't put yourself, you can't talk to anyone that's going to infect your mood. And these are like, wow, these are also yeah. like conversations that strippers have in the dressing room. It's always like, oh, that person, I can't hang out with that person because that's bad energy. And, you know, I didn't yeah. really think of it like at the time, like what that meant and like, you know, is that, is that insidious? Because then you're like closing yourself off to a certain emotion and feelings and Mm -hmm. people just so that you're in a good enough space to work. Now is a good time to hit the pause button and head over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash peep show podcast. Even $1 a month shows us that you care and want to see peep show continue to thrive. Also, you can help increase our reach with a review on iTunes. Yeah. And what has that meant for you? Well, it's exhausting. It's meant like, you know, I mean, I have, it has helped. It has helped me at least like make more friends and have a better social life because I can, I am, I do think I'm more enjoyable to be around than before when I wasn't a stripper. Like I understand now, Mm -hmm. like if I'm going out with friends, like, you know, 
you need to keep, sometimes it's good to keep things lighthearted because people need that. People need a break from right, their lives. Yeah. And so like, I don't think I understood mm-hmm. that before. I didn't understand that like, you can't just like talk about your problems all the time. Like it's important to like, <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> you know if, like, someone like your friend might need like, friend might be going through a breakup and she doesn't want to hear about your bullshit. Like she wants to like have a good time. Like, <laughs> right. So like, I think dancing really helped me like understand the function of like time and place. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, yeah. But, you know, I think at some point, like after three years or so, it, it became to the point where like I couldn't leave my house before the day before work and the day after. Like I was so exhausted that like it was just like me in bed. And that also just meant that dating was kind of out of the question because I would be so exhausted and that itself is quite destructive I think it's put me in a place where I think like I am only going to be liked or loved when I'm in a good mood and I still have that now Mm -hmm. and I still feel that like oh I'm meeting up with someone or I'm going on a date I have to like rest all day and I need to not talk about anything negative and I need to put myself into this really great state of mind because that's the only way like someone is going to like me and I of course, I never actually actively said that to myself. Right. Yeah. But, you know, these are things that I came to when I was writing. But yeah, um, but that's not actually feasible. Like you can't have a relationship that's not just entirely casual and do that. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's why I'd, I haven't really dated much. Yeah. While I was stripping. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, one of the kind of conclusions of the the piece was that you don't you don't like one of the things that this like space from work has given you during COVID is a realization that of the toll that that's taken on you. I mean, is that how you would say it? Yeah, I would. I would definitely say that like, it's, it's the toll that it has taken on me, like the emotional labor and what it has meant. Like I didn't really include it too much in the article, but you know, there's a lots of research out there on like what, like workers who are interfacing with the public, what their, you know, what their problems are. Like they not only have a lot of mental health issues, they have suicide ideation is higher. Yeah, Alcoholism wow. is really higher. Um, and these are just, I'm talking like service workers, sex workers are almost never studied in these conversations. Right. Um, because people don't, I don't know. I don't think people <laughs> realize our job is like emotional labor. I think they think it's just like bodies. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, that's how Swerfs talk about it is if we're like bodies with holes that, just lie there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish. I know that, <laughs> that sounds like so a easier job, right? <laughs> I remember I this one girl. I was talking to this girl one time in a bar, and she was telling me that she was quite. She was really broke, and she didn't have any money. And she was really, you know, cute. And I was like, "Have you ever thought about stripping?" She was like, "Oh, I don't like getting approached by men. I don't think I could do that." I'm like, "I wish men would approach me <laughs> in the club. <laughs> wish we didn't have to hustle. <laughs> wish we could just sit there and look pretty." <laughs> I wish that was my job. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's really hard. You know, yeah, you have there's to really... so many misconceptions. And I don't think that I think the whole like narrative of easy money, like obscures the work that sex workers are doing. Yeah, it's fast money, not easy. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Very different I... thing. Yeah. So where are you at now? I mean, do you do you think that stripping is something that you could go back and do or do you feel like you need kind of a break from that? I mean, it's what been, I haven't worked since January because before COVID I was on, I was doing a writing residency. Right. So I worked two shifts in January. And so really I haven't really worked since December. Yeah. Um, So it's been a long time. I miss the escape, like stripping for so many years was this like escape. And as much as like I, I can talk about the effect that deep acting has had on me. It was very much like a way for me to hide from myself and hide mm-hmm. from, you know, I have a lot of mental health issues because of like my undiagnosed autism. And yeah, so I miss having, you know, I go to the club and it's kind of like being, you step into a movie and like, you right. know, when you come out of a movie, you forget who you are, you forget your body for a second. And then, you know, I, I do kind of miss that. Um, yeah. But I'm ready to like move on, I think, in a different part part of my life. And I want to, I want a partner. Yeah. And I want to, you know, I know that there are plenty of strippers out there who have 
relationships. Um, but my capacity is limited because of my autism. And yeah. if I'm giving so much at work, it's going to affect how much I can give to other people. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think if I don't have to, look, of course, if who knows with this economy, what it's going to look like, but right. if I don't have to, I think it's like in my best interest to take a step back. Cause it's been five years, you know? Yeah. That's a long run. <laughs> It's a long run. Yeah. (laughs) I am ready to retire. (laughs) Yeah. So um, speaking of retiring, uh, you're working on something big now. Can you talk a little bit about the memoir you're doing? Yeah. So the memoir is the about like the two years before I started stripping and like the one the two years after. So it covers four years of my life. Okay. It's the time when I was starting to realize, really sort of contextualize that something was going on and that something was wrong. Mm -hmm. And that like how I kind of, I became a stripper, not just like I had to pay off my debt, A, and B, to really sort of figure out who I was and to like heal myself in this way um, before I really even knew. And so then it's like how I really realized that I was autistic through dancing and through like acting as these different people and through like interacting with customers on a day-to-day basis that I discovered that like I was on the spectrum. How did Um, you like, I I mean, I know it's probably really complex, but what, what tipped you off to that or how did you discover that? I think there's, there is two things. Um, The A it's that I struggled with, I realized when I started stripping that I struggled with like back and forth conversation Mm -hmm. and that I struggled to like interact in real time. Like me and you right now, we're interacting in real time so that we're like, you're responding. Um, You're asking me a question. I'm responding. Right. Um, Four years ago, I would not have been able to do this. Wow. You know, I would not Mm -hmm. have been able to like sit and respond in a way that like is cohesive for a conversation. And so I think, I was able to see because I had to interact in this really heightened sense. And like, in, I was, I had to like build relationships with these got like with these yeah. customers that mm-hmm. like there was something going on because I had to work so hard to learn that. Yeah. Um, was it, did it become obvious to you that other new people who came in didn't have to work as hard at those skills? No, because I think a lot of strippers are neurodivergent. Like <laughs> okay. it's been my theory. Like we're a funky bunch. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of like borderline depressive, you know, there's a lot of like, I think I actually related to a lot of dancers. And so like that itself too gave yeah. me another sort of validation. That's true of all sex work, I think. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, um, we're a fringe bunch. Yeah. <laughs> Probably also why, I I mean, that's probably in in a positive way, too. It's like a fringe, like, job that opens up space for a lot of people. Definitely. And I think, at least for me, it helped me. Like, I mean, if you go into, like, identity theory in terms of, like, what people need to, like, figure out who they are, like, they need to be around people who are like them. Right. In order, so in order for me to, like, see who I was, I think I needed to feel validated in that way. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm really lucky that like dancing gave me this huge community. Like not everyone has had that experience. And like, I'm really grateful that like, right. I was able to like build these really great friendships. And I think that helped me sort of feel a lot more confident enough to admit that I had social issues. Cause it's quite an embarrassed, not embarrassed, it's quite a shameful thing to admit. I yeah. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, and the other thing too, was that I, I can't, I struggle to like take care of my daily needs. Like I struggle to like clean up after myself and I struggle to like wash my dishes and do my laundry and dancing made that worse because of the emotional labor. Like I was, I like fell apart at the seams. And so that was kind of like the breaking point. Like I can't, couldn't do my dishes and I couldn't sort of do my laundry because I was like giving all this emotional labor to all these customers. And then it just became worse and worse. And so that was kind of like, at first, I thought I had an attention deficit disorder. Yeah. Um, but like when that sort of even became, it just, I fell apart. Then I started looking into autism. Yeah. Um, but that was the more obvious way. And I think the social like recognition came a bit later because it was more like covert. Yeah. It's also, um, you know, from what I understand is that the way in which, especially um, 
you know, I think that that may be changing a bit now, but, um, you know, women are underdiagnosed. Girls are under diagnosed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and even so they've done like studies where like they have brought two people in with the same symptoms, a girl and a boy, and the girl has to show more extreme, like more obvious symptoms for her to even get a diagnosis. So there is like a bias going on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there is a bias going on and girls itself have, there's more pressure on them to sort of relate and interact from a younger age. And right. so like they learn different skills, you know, it looks different. It just says it looks different in people of color because they're underdiagnosed as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that you talked about was the fact that it was um, hard to come to those realizations, but was there also ways in which like getting a diagnosis, an autism diagnosis felt like a um, relief or like some insight into what you were going through or how did you, how did you respond to that, I guess? It was definitely a relief. Like at first it was, you know, I'm starting to like really write about it now in mm -hmm. terms of like what those first couple of days were. And I think they were quite dark. Like that first yeah. realization to like admit to yourself that you're disabled. Mm -hmm. And it's a really, I don't think I ever realized like how much shame is around disabled disability and like what that actually means. And yeah, I think afterwards, like it was a huge sort of relief on me Yeah, to like know that it, these things like weren't my fault and I didn't have to try so hard to like function in this day-to-day -day society. I mean, I'm still trying to like, unravel that and still trying to like let myself admit that I am disabled and then I can't do everything that right. I want to do mm -hmm. um but that was like the beginning I think that first sort of getting that diagnosis was like one of the biggest steps in that yeah yeah so what's the process of writing the book been like oh god <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, am a writer, but I've never <laughs> attempted to write a book and it seems so daunting to me. Um, yeah, I mean, luckily, like, there's lots of support online and, like, so writing a memoir, like, there's lots of, like, guides online and I've been great to, like, that I have time off from this pandemic and that yeah. I, before that I went to a writing residency. But it's hard because you have to live with yourself. You're living with this, like... God, I hate to use the word trauma, but sort of this, like, the sense of everything that you've been through. And it's like, it, when you go through it in the moment, it's fine. When you write about it, it seems to be 10 times worse. Yeah. <laughs> reliving. It's like, right. This sense. Um, so, you know, I too try to, I'm trying to, like, get on some kind of schedule of, like, writing it. But, you know, I mean, it's it's been a process. Um, but, yeah, I am... I'm proud of myself for like making it this far, I think, to getting it done. What is your trajectory with that? Like, when do you think you'll be done with it? So I think probably about a year. I'm looking to sell it within about a month. I'm done with the proposal. Which oh, wow. You know, took me about six months to do. And I got an agent, which is great. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I'm on my way. Um, I'm a little nervous about like what the publishing industry is going to look like after COVID. Yeah. But I just have to, I mean, of course, positive thinking here <laughs> I mean, after all this talk that I bullshit, I guess. But I, I do need to have some dash of optimism with this. Yeah. Because... <laughs> it has to drive you forward. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Writing um, is hard. <laughs> it's a hard, it's hard thing to do. Yes. Yeah, actually, you know, I didn't think about this when I thought about talking to you, but, you know, sex work is a hard and emotionally draining job and writing is also a hard and emotionally draining job. Like, in what ways do you think those are different? I think sex work requires you to be in the present. It demands presence. Like, mm -hmm. you have to, it demands that you, like, you cannot, like, reflect sort of on the past or the forward there's like I always call it like stripper amnesia is a thing yeah interesting where like mm -hmm. you you don't even remember the only thing you remember is your last customer because the moment before it has to be out of your head for you to sort of like interact with, with the, the next, next person, person. yeah because mm -hmm. you have to go from right intimate in interaction to intimate interaction to intimate interaction yeah and that person needs a hundred percent of your attention yeah because that's what they feel is like worth it, you know? And I mean, I kind of get it. Like if I'm spending right hundreds of dollars on something, like I'd want someone to 
be, you know, present with me. Right. Um, but, and then writing itself is reflective. You're yeah. in the past, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I think, like, if I wrote all day, there was no going to work. Right. Absolutely not. You know, that yeah. was like, even if I did, I never made any money because they're just two different states of mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. So, do you find that with yourself? Um, yeah, I do. And I realize that um, if I spend too much time writing, I don't make any money. Um, and part of that is logistics. Part of it is that I get sucked up into like writing and creative projects and I don't turn my lines on and I'm not advertising and I'm not putting forward that sort of like sexy hustler energy. And so I... I need to really think about making money and think about that as different than my writing. Because if I, if I'm like, I'm going to write an article today, but I'm also going to like turn my lines on. Usually I don't make money <laughs> um, because yeah. I think my energy is just elsewhere. So mm -hmm. I do find that I need to segregate that stuff a little bit and I need to set up time to actually sit and write because if I try to do too many things at once, usually what I find is that I'm not being effective at getting anything done, really. That's how I feel. And I've like, I'm very much someone who can, prefers to focus on one thing. But I think, particularly when it comes to like writing and sex work, they need to be separate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then like nothing gets done if I try to do both of them. Right. The writing doesn't get done, nor does the um, sex work. Yeah. And I also find because a lot of my clients, because I, you know, write and do sex work under the same name, a lot of my clients are people who really like my writing. Um, but, and want to talk to me about it. And I love that. Like, I love it if I have people who want to cam or who want to like talk, call me and talk to me about things that I've written. I think that's great. What I find to be like a conflict is that, um, and this is really kind of interesting, I think, if I'm putting too much energy into peep show or into writing articles or things like that, um, a lot of my clients will say, and they can see that because of social media or something, a lot of them will say that they didn't want to bother me because it seems like I'm busy. <laughs> Oh, really? Yeah. And yeah. So, so interesting. So it's like a complex relationship because I bring in people that I want to talk to because they have, you know, some interests that are similar to mine, like in the fact that I market everything together. So that's a positive, but it's also a negative because they there's also a degree to which they feel like oh, she probably doesn't want to talk to me right now because she's busy doing X, Y, or Z. Or, you know, I I think that those those things are intention sometimes and mm. it causes it makes it a little bit difficult to um it just it just makes you know marketing complicated <laughs> yeah i mean that's just so fascinating to me because like your life is so much more accessible to your clients yeah like first i was like my clients never knew i was a writer i was always like a yoga teacher <laughs> or like a nanny or like yeah you know? <laughs> i was always just something silly and like um, not that being a yoga teacher or being a nanny is silly, but something right. like lighthearted yeah. that they can sort of like, it's more palatable to them. Right. But yeah. And I mean, I think that that's also hard because, um, they also like see into my head because I write about things that are like really personal to me. And, and I wrote a piece about this after, after an episode that you were on, actually the 16 sex workers talk about being in COVID, COVID and sex work or something. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the exact title, honestly, but and I found that sex workers talking that um, openly about how they were struggling with their own depression or how they were having a hard time feeling like sexy while they're quarantined at home or they were having a harder time putting on those performances or, you know, people said a variety of things. And honestly, that sort of transparency freaked a lot of clients out. I had people telling me that they listened to it and then they felt guilty or they felt like they didn't I, I you know it's it's funny I hadn't really thought about these things together until we started talking about this but it's almost it's exactly what you were saying so when you're not putting forward this sort of everything is great I love uh doing my job but you're instead saying actually I'm having my own sort of struggles it like humanizes us but at the same time it creates it like breaks the fourth wall it creates this um tension between 
it displays the transaction maybe is how I should say it. Yeah. I didn't think about that too itself. And I felt like friends over the years are saying like, maybe you should be more forthcoming like with your clients. And I just find that they actually never are interested in hearing anything. Like even at the ones that I have like maybe opened up to that it's always like, Oh, I don't really want to talk about your life because yeah, if they actually knew like, the struggles of myself, then they don't, they're not comfortable spending. Right. Like, and it kind of, this is, I think across all service industries, like, Mm -hmm. because we're so used to service workers, like portraying this, like, you know, happy self. Right. We then, you know, that's, that's how we feel comfortable as consumers. Right. And, and it's more complicated in sex work because, what I was seeing after that episode came out and the comments that I was getting back from listeners um, was very much like, oh, well, I didn't know that I took a lot of energy from you because what they're because what they're getting is this like experience that it's escape from their lives. <laughs> and mm-hmm. what we're doing is creating that for them, which is not our yeah. escape. It's their escape, you know, and so uh-huh. I think that. Um, it's easy to imagine that a person that you're having an intimate interaction with is having the same experience as you are. And Mm -hmm. I think that with sex work, one of the things that becomes really complicated is that you want the customers to think that. (laughs) Otherwise, they become um, really self-conscious about the experience and it's no longer as erotically charged for them. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, and that's the point of like the sales is that like you kind of had to, you want them to think that you're really into them so that they spend, you know, that they feel that they can escape into you. Right. And it is really sort of interesting. And it's also, I think, wrapped up into like femininity as well. Right. Is that like, you know, women itself are supposed to, you know, be in better moods. We're not supposed to be as moody as men. Right. You know, we're mm-hmm. supposed to be more optimistic. And so, you know, I mean, I talk about like in the piece, like about being, about having to like pretend that I was being real and like what being real meant in the club and mm-hmm. like being like authentic. And, you know, I find like that if I was like, if I, if, if my acting ever seemed like too acting that I never made, like they weren't interested. Like they right. really wanted to like, quote unquote, real experience. Right. And I just, I think I was fine with it, of course, because, you know, I understand like you, the customer wants someone to escape into and they want to this genuine experience. But I don't think I realized like how hard it is, right? you know, to act that way and how much it takes from you. And like, how do you protect yourself in that kind of way? And Right. Like, does this life, does sex work have a shelf life? And like, is it something you can do for a few years and then you have to like pack it up because it's, it's not, it's impossible to maintain, but I don't know. Yeah. These are not questions I have answers to, but it's certainly. (laughs) I don't have the answer to that question either. I think that, you know, when I think about my own like sex work career, one of the things that I think is that there are many, many consequences of doing sex work that I didn't understand on like a deep level when I got into it (laughs) um Mm -hmm. which aren't all I mean a lot of those are also like positive like I don't think that I realized that I would gain an understanding um to the degree that I have of like human desire or desire Mm -hmm. for intimacy or any of that or or things about emotional labor, anything like that or or tap into and you kind of spoke about this a community that's so so different than any other communities that I've ever been a part of. And all of that has changed my life in ways that I can't even imagine. But then it's also changed my life in so many ways that have, I don't know, that you just don't, you don't imagine what it's going to be like to like live under the stigma of sex work or to imagine that you won't be able to get any other jobs because of because of sex work stigma or to, or, you know, I think you're right. It does like change the way that you can have like intimate interactions with other people. And so I don't know, to me, it's like the most interesting job I've ever had, but also I don't know. 
I don't know if you can do it forever. <laughs> Those are also, you know, open questions to me as well. Yeah. I mean, I know I certainly know that there are like, people who have had to do it forever. And like, mm-hmm. that's certainly something like, I want to see more written about. Like what, yeah. how have they, people have managed who have had to dance for over 10 years or, yeah, you know, like down in my club and fart, a lot of those dancers like are in their fifties and they've been doing it for like a very long time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, or moving so, into different yeah. forms of sex work. Yeah. I mean, I, I know that there are people who've done it for a really long time and, uh, you know, at this point, I almost feel like, you know, I've been in it probably a similar amount of time as you in an industry that's as transient as this one is like, that's, we're like old timers. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know we are. <laughs> I feel so like at my club, there's like the one in Philly, they can have like 18 year olds working there. And I feel like a, like a crone when I'm walking <laughs> <laughs> like a wizen, you know, wizard over here. <laughs> yeah, so I don't the know the answer day. to those questions either. I'm going to keep going for now, you know, as long as I can, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, it was really 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 great to talk to you about all of this and yeah, thank um, you for having me. Yeah, where can people find your writing and your work? Um, you can find me look up my hashtag <laughs> um i just reese piper on twitter um and i also have a website and it is um reesepiper.com um cool thank you so much for chatting with me today yeah thank you jesse we'll talk soon Thank you for joining us for yet another episode of the Peep Show podcast. I'm PJ Sage, and you can find me on Twitter at Peach Sage. And I'm Jesse Sage, and you can find me on Twitter at SapioTextual or at jessiesage.com. We would like to remind you that we have a Patreon account and would appreciate your support. Please visit patreon.com slash peepshowpodcast. Our music is courtesy of Joe Kennedy. The show was produced by Jesse and PJ Sage. Signing off. Have a great week.